Right, well, um, let's get this uh, this show on the road. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to join us here for this side event at uh, ESA Fi Week. Um, it's uh, it's a real honour to host uh, this team of people who will be presenting this afternoon. Um, and but I want to really kind of thank you lot all for attending because that's uh, you are the people that are going to make this um, a very useful event. Uh, and I'd like to also thank ESA for uh, allowing me to host this. And, um, and and one other person who can't be with us, I'd like to thank Giovanni Marchisio from Planet who uh, has helped put the agenda together and certainly helped me with some of the thinking behind this session. But unfortunately, he's flying, I think, at the moment, so uh, he's unable to join the call. So what I want to do in my first sort of 10 minutes is just to uh, explain a bit of the background to why I've put this uh, event together uh, and some of the... Uh, the sort of context really uh, that what we'll uh, that we'll be talking amongst. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, just a little cartoon here. This is um, I started my Earth observation career quite a long time ago now, and uh, this is what uh, Earth observation used to be like for me. It was basically like waiting for a tap to drip. So um, I'd be sitting in my office waiting for satellites to fly over, uh, looking out the window, and then deciding uh, whether there was much chance of me getting any. Uh, Earth observation data for that day or that week or month, etc. And most of this work uh, was to do with uh, something called the UK land cover map. Uh, and during its 2000, uh, year 2000 iteration, uh, I was I was managing the project, and so we had to collect a whole series of Earth observation images uh, and be able to then stitch those together and generate a, a land cover product. Um, but what you'll see here, even though it's called land cover map 2000. Um, the image data takes actually came from a period between 1996 and 2001. Uh, we had 79 images to cover the whole of the UK. Uh, we actually wanted a uh, uh, two, two seasonal snapshots, effectively a, a, an autumn or a, uh, autumn and summer or um, sort of winter and summer image. So we had kind of leaf off, leaf on situations and crops in fields and etc. You can see in order to try that we. Uh, um, it took five years of image acquisition. And so we still were some areas were mapped with just one image, and some areas were not mapped with any images at all, and had to be filled in with a, a previous iteration of the product. And you can also see on the right there, the final product looks quite nice, but uh, you see it wasn't actually eventually uh, uh, validated and launched until 2002. So. You can see if I'm announcing to the world that this is the new land cover map 2000, that we're uh, we're actually using data from 1996. So uh, the information could in fact be uh, up to sort of seven years, five, uh, six, seven years out of date. Uh, and this was caused really by the basic problems in the earth observation um, sort of sector or setup, you might say. So there was a paucity or a lack of data. So there weren't the instruments in orbit, um, they were on um, uh, orbital setups, so they didn't acquire imagery very often. Uh, when they did acquire imagery, um, the systems weren't really in place to deliver that quickly to the end users. So there was a big latency problem. So we'd have to wait for images to be downloaded, processed somewhere, um, digital information sent to us. Uh, and even in some cases, we had to receive quick looks by fax if any of you know what a fax is. So you can imagine the challenges we had in piece in the map together. And so the result really was that we could only map what had happened and what was not happening. So we were always working in the past and never uh, up to date. Uh, and we were also confounded by dynamic features. So we know the landscape is uh, highly dynamic on various time scales. Uh, and we can see that uh, Things like adjacent images might have different phenological stages, which caused us problems. So it was difficult to get these detailed synoptic views of large areas in order for to do our land cover mapping. So it made it far more challenging. So you can imagine how relieved I was when along came the golden age of Earth observation. So within the last 10 years or so, we had a massive expansion in the amount of observing, observing capacity in orbit. Um, and it's often been taught, described as uh, dealing with the data deluge or actually taking things like taking a drink from a fire hydrant in order to uh, work, work with this data. So what we're, we're in a position now where we did, we've cured that paucity of information problem uh, and also with cloud computing and uh, network resources, we can now actually re reduce that latency problem as well. So 
we can now get to this point where we can work with high cadence Earth observations. So perhaps what do I define as high cadence Earth observations? So really it's where we're collecting an image, images a bit sort of between daily and weekly intervals. Um, and so we can capture the changing variability of the landscape or the features that we're looking at. And we're really looking at the sort of higher spatial resolutions so we can see individual real world features uh, and try to understand how they're behaving over time. And this is a great, this is a Sentinel-2 time series. Uh, it's for one year in a place called Norfolk in the UK. But you can see at the top, we have some intertidal areas. We can see the tide coming in and out. So that's another one of those confounding factors we had to deal with in our UK land cover maps. But then in the fields, we can see the different management practices, the crops growing and then being harvested and the land prepared again. And at the bottom there, you can even see the shadows being cast by the woodland as the illumination changes during the year. So what does this give us then? This is, uh, so now we have this high cadence um, image, uh, earth observation data. If we can harness it, what can it give us? And the first and most obvious thing is that it allows us to take action. Uh, much more quickly. So rather than waiting seven years for an image or a map to be produced, we can actually then respond much more quickly. So we have earlier detection uh, and then we can have faster responses. And there's a whole range of applications that are built around that and some of those we'll we'll hear about today. But equally important, I think one of the things is that we're now starting to see is that we're starting to monitor process in the, in the environment. And we're able to, app, to map what is happening. We can start to consider natural and anthropogenic changes and and the processes and models and variations that we know from theoretical knowledge or lab experiments or field experiments that we know are happening in the landscape and we can now start to detect them from earth observation and this also includes subtle changes so things that are changing very slowly over time and may be very difficult to to understand the change in a uh, in two images separated a long distance in time but we can actually pick up those trends if we can see much more frequent imagery. Uh, and where we are dealing with uncertain features, maybe the change is not that great, uh, that the buildup of evidence over time gives us an idea of what, um, the, whether the change itself is persistent or is it just a small aberration or even an error in the data, the uncertainty in the data that's uh, being recorded. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna uh, use a quote that uh, thankfully Will Marshall um, a le a less we use quite regularly and it's to this idea of getting inside the human decision making loop and I think that's something that earth observation has not really um, done in many instances in the past but what we're now able to do is offer up information that allows policy makers land managers uh, or, or other decision makers to, to look at the environment and how it's changing and therefore to take some really effective and useful actions. So that's what I'm interested in hearing about today from our guest speakers um, and hopefully that will give they'll be able to give us a an overview of the sort of things that we can act can now achieve with high cadence earth observation. So these are just the basic objectives of this side event. So uh, I've probably mentioned these already, but I want to understand what uh, opportunities e high cadence EO opens up for us. Uh, I want to look at some examples or I'd, I'd like our guests to present with some examples and use cases. And hopefully through that, we'll identify what are the opportunities, risks, issues, et cetera, bottlenecks that there may be uh, in, in these sort of processing lines. And also uh, take a look to the future and how this uh, use of high cadence earth observation will uh, expand in the, uh, as we move forwards. So here's the agenda. You all have access to this uh, through the through the Brella system. Um, so that's uh, kind of my sort of introduction. Uh, and so on, what we'll do now is we'll run through each of the presentations uh, in order, uh, and then we'll have a discussion session at the end where you can uh, raise your questions. And we'll be able to track uh, your questions if you write them into the chat function on, on the WebEx. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning, but you probably all should have seen the um, uh, the sort of disclaimer at the beginning of the session that it is being recorded. So uh, if we have anyone who's speaking uh, doesn't want to have their image recorded, then they're more than welcome to sort of uh, mute their cameras. OK, so what we'll do now is we'll move on to our first speaker, and I'm really pleased to welcome my colleague, uh, Aneta Wanya, sorry, from Planet. 
Um, and we're, we're working on another project together, but interestingly, she's also working on something very close to my heart, which is uh, the Korean land cover project, part of the uh, Copernicus land monitoring service. And she's going to uh, give us some updates on how that may be um, uh, in updates that may be improved with high cadence EO. So uh, if I just stop sharing, I should be able to hand this over to you now. And, uh... Okay. Thanks very much, Jeff, for the introduction and for inviting me to, to, to speak in this session and to present you, I think, a very exciting project we're working on. Um, I will now, you can hear me correctly, right? Yes, and I should have just made you presenter if that. Okay, so I will share on the screen. Okay, so my name is Anne Vanya, and as uh, Jeff said, I work for Planet Labs, uh, the German branch of Planet Labs in Berlin. And I will be presenting on, on here, as you see from the topic, it's, and as Jeff said already, it's about um, land cover mapping using high frequency uh, data sets and targeting here, especially um, higher frequency updates of Korea. Um, so let me start with a couple of words about Planet for those who don't know us and also to give you an, a reason why we are involved in this project. Um, so I'm not sure if we can see your screen. Can every, anyone else see the screen? I'm not. No, I'm not. Try again. Now you see your screen? Something's happening here. Yeah. Now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yes. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. That was the <laughs> first slide. Just to introduce the title. Um, and now moving on to a slide which explains Planet in, in some I think impressive numbers. So Planet is a vertically integrated aerospace and data analytics company, and we are currently operating the largest commercial constellation of Earth imaging satellites. And thanks to that constellation, we are able to, to image the Earth um, every day, the entire landmass. And with this, we, we came up to imaging it uh, 1,000 times nowadays. So just to let think these numbers a little bit, um, meaning that today we are producing um, more imagery per pixel than Landsat Sentinel and um, all the commercial actors in combination. And that is uh, an opportunity, but also a challenge. And um, coming to the, the, the context, the thematic context of, of my presentation, so land cover is, has a long tradition in Earth observation. And it's nowadays recognized as a key data set for measuring the human footprint um, the impact of human footprint on our planet. It is recognized also for, for policy purposes. Um, we know it's used, um, Earth observation plays a role in, or is recognized as a source of information for monitoring uh, the sustainable development goals. And here in the study on the right top, you see um, that it was shown that it contributes to monitoring progress towards uh, eight indicators. In four of them, it's considered as an essential data set, and four others um, as a complementary data set. And if you now, if we go back to the European um, key data set, um, which is obviously Korean, um, and it's the, 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 the data set we are targeting also in the project I will shortly introduce. Um, Korean um, is the key data set, um, or the flagship data set, even we can say in, in Europe, it's managed, uh, inserted under the Copernicus land monitoring service. Um, it's underpinning various policies in the domains of environment, um, agriculture, spatial planning and transportation. And, but what we observe is it's updated in a rather slow frequency every six years in a, we think also rather labor intensive process and that's exactly uh, where we want to start or, go, or go, contribute with a new um, innovative approach. If we look at the um, technology side of land cover monitoring, the satellite constellations um, are now producing continuous stream of data and, and, and Jeff said that earlier that especially in the last decade um, we have seen several re new land cover maps produced globally which are also thanks to open access to, to Earth observation data are now um, released at 
higher spatial resolution, but also at higher frequency. And also the technology, the technological advances such as cloud computing and, and AI, artificial intelligence allow processing these massive uh, data streams. We believe though that there has been little exploration of um, deep learning techniques to leverage the spatial temporal dimension at scale. And um, we believe also that maybe we're not yet taking enough advantage of combining different sensors and these massive data streams for both. And here is uh, the idea about uh, Horizon 2020 project, which we have started in January this year. It's running until March 2023, so 27 months. And we have launched this project with the firm belief that by combining Sentinel-2 with the higher resolution and higher temporal and spatial resolution uh, planet scope, um, data sets and the power of machine learning, we can contribute to increasing the update, update frequency of Korean. And also with that demonstrate the added value of integrating also state-of-the-art technology in the process of uh, the Korean updates. How do we do this? Uh, the strategy is twofold. On the one hand side, we are, and that's also the data set used in, in the project, we are creating um, the most complete and dense remote sensing spatial temporal machine learning training corpus to date, which is combining Sentinel-2 and Planet Scope um, at three meter resolution. And we are doing this for 500,000 patch locations in Europe. Um, another important aspect here is that we will be open sourcing this corpus for the benefit of the entire remote sensing community. And the second part of the strategy, we will be developing and benchmarking alternative ways for detecting and classifying changes from very high cadence observations by training state-of-the-art multi-scale supervised and unsupervised deep learning classifiers on these unique data sets. Um, some words about the, um, the first part of the strategy, so this uh, spatial temporal corpus that we are building, it's inspired um, uh, by the Big EarthNet and Eurosat data sets. On the right-hand side, you see the, the 500,000 um, locations in which we are sampling 600 by 600 meter patches um, and creating data sets from Sentinel-2 and Planet uh, Fusion yearly time, list, time series. I will say a um, couple of words about Fusion in the next slide. Um, we'll be annotating this data set with the Korean uh, land cover class, of the, the labels from uh, the 2018 data set. And then, um, yeah, as I said, open source this in July, actually next year. So it's not, far away from today. Um, some words about Planet Fusion is what we call um, uh, the, it's a data set that we will be heavily using throughout the Rapid AI for your project. Um, it's Planet's first in a, um, in a series of game-changing fusion products that combines multiple data types and refines them into a single information stream. Um, it is created based on the so-called um, system approach, CubeSat enables spatial temporal enhancement method. You see the reference on the uh, top right. Um, this is an approach to, to enhance, harmonize, uh, intercalibrate and fuse cross-sensor data streams, leveraging on the rigorously calibrated gold standard satellites like Sentinel-2, uh, Landsat, Sentinel Landsat uh, and MODIS, and in synergy, of course, then with the superior resolution CubeSats from Planet. And, what you see in the, in the videos at the bottom, um, the two left uh, in videos show you the input data sets, so plant scope, top of atmosphere reflectance on the very left, and then the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data set in, in the middle, and then leading to um, an, a cloud-free harmonized gap-filled uh, data set on the right-hand side, which is this planet fusion data set that provides uh, daily uh, values per pixel at three meter resolution. Um, so in order to achieve the goal, I, I mentioned it, we are using both Sentinel-2 and uh, Planet Fusion uh, with the different resolution in terms of spatial, but also temporal resolution. So for Sentinel-2, we're creating monthly uh, cloud-free mosaics. Um, and for Planet, we use the, the daily um, gap-filled imagery that I just showed. Um, one of the main goals uh, of Rapid AI for you is to investigate what, what are the actual gains of this improved spatial, but also temporal resolution of the planet data. And um, you can see uh, this improved um, temporal resolution in the plots on the right-hand side. Uh, these show NDVI density plots, uh, where you can 
clearly see on the top is the Sentinel-2 plot uh, with the monthly values and not at the bottom the planet fusion uh, plot, uh, which shows you that you can clearly or much better distinguish phenological stages in, from the planet fusion data set. Um, and this, this could, um, we believe, help uh, better characterizing also the underlying land cover and its changes over time. Um, then the, the second part of the project will be looking into uh, change detection, um, developing models here using deep learning techniques. We are combining or we are using both supervised and unsupervised methods. Um, the supervised change detection method um, is here based on the idea of the, the spatial temporal patching coding. So we are learning relevant features by a deep learning uh, model via supervised tasks and then use these um, learned models in a change detection approach. Um, from this unsupervised and semi-supervised models, um, on the other hand, uh, we think they, they hold the promise definitely to learn um, to disentangle phenology from structural changes, which are uh, what we want to detect uh, in the Korean data set, uh, and then detect anomalies based on these expected temporal patterns at any given location. And what we'll do, we combine these, these two approaches, or we combine the most performing models, both supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, in an ensemble approach in order to come up uh, with a heat map of changes, which would then allow to prioritize areas for, for map updates of the Korean. Um, and then I will finish with some key takeaways. So I think you, you understood that we, for sure, with this project, we want to, to drive a paradigm shift away from the conventional approaches to change detection, which are so far typically based on, a, on measuring a few points in time towards a scenario which involves monitoring and tracking change continuously. Um, we'll create for this, uh, this corpus um, that who's, who's inspired by Big EarthNet and Eurosat dataset, but the, the main innovation here is the, the addition of the high cadence time series at all locations. And we'll be open sourcing this um, to the community. Um, the high cadence time series will improve our understanding of land use and especially if you think of uh, classes like pasture land, grasslands, wetlands, um, but also we, we see it in construction mine dump sites um, in an order also then to adopt sustainable agricultural uh, practices. So the results from the first results from the supervised models, um, and that's the table on the right, show already um, the advantage of including uh, the high cadence temporal information in the change classification. Models, so we are optimistic that we'll, uh, we'll, which can, we will be able to show this further in the project and use for the benefit of, of Corrine, uh, hopefully then proposing this for integration later in, in time. And with this, I will close here. You can follow us um, um, on the website. We have a LinkedIn profile also. We'll post there regularly also blogs explaining a bit, giving some insights about what we do, progress in the, in the project and we'll be posting also material. So thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you, Annette. Uh, we're gonna move swiftly on just so that we can try and keep to time. And uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Lucia if she can uh, present. So it's Lucia Nieto uh, and Ignacio Campiti, Campiti, I think, from um, Kansas State University. So uh, early in the morning for you, it's late in the afternoon for us <laughs> yeah, in Europe. So uh, over to you. And so we're going to take this uh, this crop and map um, land cover mapping one step further to look at crop phenology. Thank you. Can you share your screen? I don't, I don't know why, but I'm not able to share my screen. Um, okay. So I'm I'm okay. new with this. Okay. No, that's uh, fine. That's uh, I think we all are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is um, okay. I don't know which portion of my screen are you able to uh, see. We're seeing the um, the WebEx. Uh, side. Okay, so let me draw this here. Nope, and we still have problem. Okay, and give me a second. Sorry for the inconvenience. It's okay. No worries. <laughs> I was hoping to practice today before with WebEx, but okay. So let me see. Okay, this is my presentation. I don't know how to change the. 
Uh, when, when you hit share screen, does it give you various window options? No, because at the bottom, I don't have that option. It's just blocked. So I'm sharing from the top that says share, share my meeting window. So oh, that's why you, hey. you're sharing that, which is weird. If you um if you just start uh -huh. playing oh um, uh, yeah it, well could you just start playing your presentation now? Yeah, I'm not playing it, so it's just I have my PowerPoint open. Okay, okay. let's see what's the problem here. It seems that I don't have available the share bottom. Ah, uh, uh, to share uh, content. Are, are you on a, a, a an Apple or a Mac rather? Yes. Okay, I'm Valeria, do you we, do we have a? Yeah, because uh, I'm trying to to make her presenter, but uh, actually I don't have this option available for her. Okay, so that's it's the problem. Something, yeah, maybe um, uh, sometimes if you uh, quit the call and then you enter again. Uh, okay, sure. It, yeah, we we can try. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do that. Do that. Okay, <laughs> sorry for brilliant. inconvenience. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, shall we? We could always move on to um, another presentation yeah. then. Is that? Let's shall do we that. that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, um, right. Well, our third presentation is uh, from um, from Vim Svagenberg. Apologies for if I saw you said your name wrong there. But now we're going to take a completely different angle and look at um, emergency management and uh, conflict applications. So uh, over to you, Vim, if you can. Share your screen. Ah, I need to make that. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Apologies, I'm coming down with a sore throat. So, uh, well, well, me too. I, I can mute myself occasionally. <laughs> okay, there you um, go. Yeah, so let's see. I uh, hope everything is visible here now. Uh, yeah, you're in um, editing mode, but uh, yeah, you just fire up Coming the. To, uh, Going to the um, that's weird. This should work. Ah, um, still editing mode because because I have two screens. But uh, yeah. forgive me. Um, I hope this works anyway. Um, can can you swap screens? Yeah, that's it. That's right. That one there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. That's right. Off you go. Thank Excellent. you. Um, so I'll be presenting a little bit on um, a bit more on uh, what work we're doing as a peace organization on the environmental dimensions of armed conflict, and in particular how we use Earth observation as a tool to identify the specific environmental elements, and how this has been supporting humanitarian response and post-conflict reconstruction work. And the backstory to this was that um, for uh, quite an extensive period, the um, environmental of the environmental impact linked with in times of armed conflict has been sort of off the radar uh, because often the environment was sort of considered as a soft issue and as a, a less of a priority in humanitarian response. But over the course of various uh, over the last two decades, we've seen how. Uh, impacts of armed conflict on the environment has a direct impact on human health, has an impact on livelihoods of people, and also in long-term and reconstruction efforts. However, there was little data available to understand the full size of this work. So during the work, uh, during the uh, the the um, the Syrian conflict, uh, which when it, when it escalated in 2012 and 13. Um, a part of my work, I was already doing some work on the environmental impacts in Iraq, specifically looking at munitions impact. But we also noticed like the 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 concerns along lo local communities on sort of the lack of cleanup and remediation efforts. And back then, um, I was involved um, with uh, to get working together with Elliot Higgins, who later started uh, the open source investigative collective Bellingcat. Uh, already looking at Syria, for example, how we can use open source information to identify and geolocate uh, impact from, for example, barrel bombs in cities in Syria. So when Bellingcat was launched, we thought like, hey, we can use also this open source method to actively monitor uh, environmental impacts on, on the ground. 
And before uh, UN Environment was doing really great work with various reports, for example, in the Balkans, in Iraq, in, in South Sudan and Sudan, and they applied the Earth observation tools. But often their work was uh, yeah, published years after the conflict, or it was limited because of limited, inf uh, limited uh, funding to, to uh, write those reports. Um, and um, yeah, so we thought like, hey, we can try to see what we can actually do already during the conflict. And for example, if there are imminent risk for civilians from like bombings of sites containing hazardous materials or risk from uh, damage to agriculture infrastructure that needs to be fixed or water infrastructure, we can already do, already do this. Um, and also uh, moving on, how can this be incorporated into humanitarian response? Because often the humanitarian community is the first to respond to things, uh, to crisis and in, in, also in conflicts. Um, so we started engaging a bit more, uh, in particular around the, uh, the, uh, the the war against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. So in 2016, we um, we looked at how, uh, for example, um, the impacts um, uh, we could predict some kind of impacts in the Mosul operation and trying to identify uh, areas where there are using open source information where there are. Um, particular uh, risk to civilians from bombings of, of industrial facilities. Um, and later on, we extended that to look at, okay, there's like direct impacts, but you also have like the ripple impacts. So for currently we're doing a report on looking on deforestation in Syria, where we can uh, identify like areas that have made a risk from growing energy prices and look how the 10 years conflict resulted in uh, Cutting, cutting, and uh, cutting down of large areas uh, with uh, with trees, which uh, also have an implication for uh, post-conflict um, um, response work, but also it could link also with climate resilience because uh, those are uh, the last remaining forest areas of Syria. Um, it also has an impact on environmental governance. So, for example, you see also in conflicts how um, the growth of landfills are, are a particular issue. Um, and the people started people starting burning plastics or or solid waste, which has an impact, a health impact on air pollution or for nearby communities, which we try to identify also using open source where those information and satellite imagery to to look at landfills and growing landfills and the vicinity to populated areas. And yeah. Um, and give the, I was requested to give a couple of samples because it was kind of difficult because we're doing quite a lot to look at like short case studies and longer term patterns of analysis on uh, impact of the conflict on natural resources. Here's an, an, uh, an uh, article we did a year ago uh, on Yemen, where a local news source reported on the disappearance of date palms. Um, and in the case of Yemen, we looked at agricultural change in these particular uh, areas on the west coast of Yemen, um, using both uh, Im imagery from um, high resolution imagery from Planet and also from um, Google Earth, which had updated imagery there. So we could track like the how the um, increase of uh, fuel prices and the lack of water resources had an impact on date plantations on the coast. Uh, allegedly, four out of the eight million date palms have been dying there in the last uh, five years uh, since the conflict erupted, um, which also, of course, had an impact on the on livelihoods of farmers. So here, uh, having visualizing uh, those kind of impacts through Earth observation, it was very helpful to put this specific topic on the radar, uh, looking at how natural resources are affected by conflict. And it can also uh, push for um, uh, policies change uh, or push for specific policy responses to ensure that affected uh, communities get the necessary response or to understand like the broader patterns of conflict on people's life. Uh, and that's where, and like using those earth observation methods, you can sort of track those kind of um, uh, specific uh, problems in specific areas. Uh, this summer, we also looked at, uh, again, um, using both uh, Sentinel-2 and Planet imagery together with other data sets to look at the impact of the closure, or not the closure, but the lack of rain in uh, Turkey, which resulted in lack uh, and less fill of the dams. Uh, those uh, dams and the, um, the, um, the water infrastructure is key for agriculture in Syria. Um, so here again, um, 
using remote sensing, trying to see what the fills are of the various lakes that are going into the Euphrates River and how lowering of the lakes had an impact on a uh, change in vegetation in the various areas in the conflict affected, uh, in conflict affected Syria. Uh, again, also they're uh, aiming to use this to push for response to this clearly climate linked uh, change. And, but also um, there's also a human element into it because Turkey was saving up water for its own agricultural projects in the south of Turkey. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of um, debate over to what extent there was like an intended or um, decision to cut off water to Syria, or it was more linked to preserving water for their own farmers. I think it could be a bit of both. But here as well, Earth observation is a, a key tool to look at how changing natural resources linked with climate have an impact, uh, compounding impact on conflict affected areas. Um, in particular, in Syria, we looked at, uh, for example, oil pollution. So here, uh, using various open source uh, methods and remote sensing, uh, we looked at oil spills in the, in the northeast of Syria. Um, we just returned from this particular area a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we've been looking at uh, how the conflict had an impact on professional refining, uh, how it led to the growth of makeshift refining. Um, so those are, those are sort of small refineries which are built by local communities because the uh, professional refineries were shut down and using Earth uh, observation data, we could map all those kind of clusters throughout Syria where we identified over 350 clusters and probably having um, like roughly 25 to 30,000 smaller refineries in the period 2012, 2000. 17, 2018, uh, and those cause a lot of pollution of groundwater, uh, agricultural land, and exposure of people working in those refineries, in particular children. So we sort of mapped this whole um, uh, yeah, new method for for communities, but also um, problems with professional refineries. So here you see, for example, oil spill, which happened two years ago, uh, basically, uh, here we use also remote sensing data, sorry, uh, artificial um, or machine learning to look at a specific specific location uh, where you see everything. You see the center location where the red is. Uh, it's a oil storage facility where there was um, um, oil waste water directly uh, released into uh, local rivers, and it has been going on now for seven years and we try to use their machine learning there to if you can identify all the contaminated areas uh, in this particular area and uh, i've been visited the location a couple of weeks as well and it's still an ongoing problem uh, where uh, oil wastewater is directly flowing into an, an 80 long kilometer river that's going into all kind of agriculture areas and there's like persistent pollution and uh, groundwater pollution as well uh, people or, or farmers cannot take water wells anymore because the groundwater is such contaminated with oil. So, uh, yeah, basically combining all those methods to get a better picture of conflict pollution in this particular area. And lastly, Can you wrap up now? Oh, you got one more example? Yeah. Uh, lastly, this okay, is, brilliant. Uh, something again, uh, grateful for Planet to use their examples where we used mapped the oil spills and discharges from wastewater at the Banias refinery in the east of Syria. Uh, over the course of three years and trying to identify what the sources of pollution are and, and the general uh, impact on coastal and marine pollution um, uh, zones. Uh, it was sort of the wrap up. Um, so we, we'd like to engage with the community of Earth Observation uh, practitioners to learn a bit more. Like we're just two people at, at PAX doing this, but we're really keen to interest to work with people, how, how their expertise can contribute to understanding this and link this more into humanitarian response and sort of see if we can build sort of the different sources and methods to look at specific, specific impacts on natural resources. So uh, feel free to get in touch um, if you have ideas and uh, yeah, be looking forward to follow following up discussion after this session. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks, that guy. that's really interesting. I think uh, we can all see from those examples how, uh, you know, you need, you need to act quickly and uh, you need the high cadence. Uh, EO for that. Right, let's try Luciana again. So uh, I'll try and make you, I can make you a presenter now. Okay, perfect. Now it's, okay. I think we'll be fine. <laughs> <clears throat> oh.
hopefully you are seeing my screen. Yes, my presentation great. now. Great. <laughs> yeah, Sorry for, for all the problems before. No, no so, worries, off you go. In this opportunity, I'll be discussing the use of course of high frequency Earth observation. And this presentation is also a little bit tied to the first one because we are using the Planet Fusion product, as you will see in a minute. So my name is Luciana Nieto. I'm a PhD student working with Dr. Ignacio Ciampiti at Kansas State University. We are part of the Department of Agronomy in the College of Agriculture. My background is in, in agronomy and I'm working on the remote sensing area for my PhD. Also, we are part of a really big team. We are more than 26 students working with Dr. Ignacio on many multiple topics from different crops, different methodologies, and also earth observation, which is my part. And today I will be presenting a little bit of my dissertation on the importance of phenology and how we are tracking uh, the progress. So first, I always like to start explaining why phenology, because normally for agronomists and people related to agriculture, we tend to look at the end of the of the process during harvest and and try to define the yield process. But phenology is a key component because basically explain how the plant is growing through the entire season. And this is tied to field management practices to find the specific moments when we need to start working, water, water budgets specifically here where we have a really big area under irrigation as well as policymakers, international markets to set up the prices. And now we are moving a little bit more into adding this layer as a part of predictive models. So currently in the United States at least, USDA is the one in charge of reporting the progress of crop phenology. In this case, this is an example for maize, corn, that is a really extensive crop here, at least in this area. And this uh, is an example extracted from one of the reports they are releasing weekly where we can see the progress in percentage. The way that these numbers are built is using a network of agricultural agents that go to the field and collect the measurement, report, and prepare everything together. Uh, then the past year, they started to try to also work with remote sensing, but still this is what we, we have at the end of the week. So in our group, we decided to say, okay, what happened if we start blending this information with remote sensing to try to improve and remove a little bit the human component? So we know perfectly well there is a huge and strong relationship between the values of the different indices and the spectral component across the season. So when the plant is growing, we start having a little bit more signal. And then when the plant starts dying, when the, the middle of the season starts to decay, those values start to, to get down. So we try to combine these two things together and we have the opportunity to access uh, to a really broad ground truth database, which is not very common. And normally we struggle to, to find ground truth data and quality ground truth data. But in this opportunity, we had a company that was collecting information through the entire state of Kansas. We are pretty much in the middle of the country. For those who are not aware where Kansas is, we are in the middle of the United States pretty much. And it's a really uh, agricultural zone. It's below the corn belt, but still the, the yields and, and the agricultural component is really strong. So this company collected information on different fields and they collected the day that they took the measure, the phenology information for that specific crop, in our case, will be uh, maize because we decided to just take that one, but we have information on other crops. And also a very important part that normally we don't have access is the geolocation. So we were able to tie the phenology measurements to a specific location in the field and in an entire region. So from this uh, ground truth data, for 2017, we had 91 measurements across the, the region that we decided to tackle. So we added the same date for weather data, some components such as precipitation, temperatures, and vapor pressure deficit, all very important things for crop production. And then we decided to take two different uh, roads. First, we decided to use 
the product, uh, the fusion product from Planet, where we extracted the band, the, inform the spectral information from the bands, and we calculated different vegetation indices related to the crop progress. And we, although, as uh, Annette mentioned, this is uh, a daily product, so we had the opportunity to match perfectly our ground truth database with the satellites, with the, those images. So we extracted exactly 91. And then we train this in a random forest classifier to see how is the, the performance at each phenological stage, as we will see in a minute. And then we try to do the same using Sentinel-2. And the reason why we use Sentinel-2 and not other fusion products is because this is well extended in agronomy, in the agronomy world. So we decided to tackle that product to see how this will work and to use it as a benchmark. Again, we extracted all information from the bands and the same vegetation indices. Once we had all that, the first uh, objective from our work was try to identify this optimal combination of variables, combining all the weathers, the bands, and the vegetation indices. And once we had that, we evaluate the performance comparing both uh, products, right? And these are a little bit the results. As we can see, this is a, a confusion matrix organizing all the elements. We want pretty much all the elements around the main diagonal, as we have here. The overall uh, F1 score for this particular case was around 0.94, which is a really high value compared to what we had in the past. We test also this uh, a few years back using Landsat. And then when we look at each specific phenological stage, we can see those metrics are also really high and which is pretty much what we want. Then when we move to use Sentinel-2, the problem that we have since we only were able to capture five images is that our window to see what is happening in the crop, normally a corn uh, here in the United States and specifically in Kansas is planted around early, uh, late April, early May, and harvested around October. So if we only have five moments in the season to see what is happening, we will only see a few of those phenological stages instead of see the entire picture. And this is what we are seeing here. Although the F1 score was still really high because it was 0.86, the only phenological stages that we were able to capture were these three. And one of those that is really critical for us, that is BT, that is when pretty much all the ill components are started to define in the, in the plant, is impossible, it was not captured very well in this process. So then we decided what? What happened if we in, increase a little bit the window? In, using the same image, we will add three days before and three days after from our ground truth database to try to see into the past and into the future three days with the same image. And the results were this. Of course, the, the number of phenological stages now is a little bit bigger because we were able to see a little bit more, but the final value was a little bit impacted and some of the stages still were not properly classified. So we decided to move this a little bit further and take 10 days before and 10 days after just to prove a concept, and these are the results. We were able to see all those phenological stages pretty much the entire season, but though that main diagonal where we want to have all the values, now is a little bit off. And the result is F the F1 score that we got, it was 0.60. And each phenological stage, as we can see here, was not properly classified. So this was, uh, I'm just sh showing a tiny portion of the, the entire uh, project that we did, but I think this is helping to really emphasize the importance on having daily gap-free images, which is what we had with this Planet Fusion product, and how this impacted improving this accuracy and the overall metrics and giving us the opportunity to really classify each specific phenological stage which is for, for farmers, stakeholders, and policymakers, and every actor in the chain, 
is really important because it helps us to really take more proactive actions instead of reacting. And also uh, something that I always like to stress in this, uh, in this type of conference is the importance of having ground truth data. In our case, we had this lack of having a huge database provided by, by a company, but still, if we want to transfer this and train in another places, we still need that ground truth data. And I think it's an important thing to, to start, start thinking about. With that, I want to thank you, all of you for your time. If you want to learn more about our team and our projects, as I mentioned before, we are 26 students working on different things. You can follow our QR code here where we have our um, websites and social media. And if you want to learn more about my project, feel free to contact me. This is my, my email. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Luciana. That's excellent. Uh, we're going to quickly speed on to our next presenter now. So uh, hopefully she now has uh, presenter privileges. I I'd now like to welcome Iris Muller, uh, professor from the uh, Trinity College uh, in Dublin. And uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, how high cadence Earth observation can be exploited in the coastal zone. So on to our next different uh, domain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, let me just uh, see if I can share my screen here. And while I do that, hopefully that will work. So I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're in uh, editing mode now, so. I'm just going to do that. Can you? Oh, sorry. Yep, that's wrong, great. Sorry, wrong, oh. <laughs> wrong presentation. Just a second. Um, they look good. <laughs> I've just come from a lecture to students, so um, I will. I've got the right one now, hopefully. Um, can you still? No, you can't now. See, I've stopped sharing. Have I? Can you still? No, no, we can see it, but we it's in present uh, in editing mode. Okay, That's so it. hopefully you've got it now. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to come in here. So I don't know. Um, you know how how much um, you, you've sort of heard of of dynamic uh, environments that that change on an, on really the, a vast number of different timescales. And I've I've myself worked in coastal systems for the last thirty years, and it's probably some of the most dynamic environments that I could imagine on a number of different timescales. And that's why you know I personally find them really fascinating. But also that's why they give us a lot of uh, you know, problems as humans when we live near the coast and we're now seeing um, vast population numbers uh, at the coast and the coastal populations are increasing at three times the rate of the globe, global average. So um, understanding how coasts change and why they change and um, how we can uh, respond and predict those dynamics is really, really important. And now, um, we also um, really have this problem that coasts change uh, sometimes on annual, you know, annual timescales and annual sort of um, time grabs, if you like, are enough for us to understand coastal sediment movement. And you can see that on the right hand slide, uh, right hand side of this slide, the animation there, where sandbars are migrating relatively continuously um, over decades from one place to another. But on the left hand side, you see the impact of a really strong individual storm surge that um, has caused havoc. Uh, in this case, case, on the west coast of Ireland, and we're all familiar with the hurricane uh, damage that is regularly caused in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, uh, in the US. So coasts are dynamic on, on a number of different timescales. Why are they so dynamic? Well, um, there are multiple drivers that force coasts to change. They are often unpredictably forced, uh, largely because meteorological forces act on the coast. They are multidirectionally forced. So unlike river systems, for example, where we um, at least know the direction in which the water is flowing um, for most of the time and we floods may occur, but the directionality is always clear. That is not necessarily the case in the coastal context. They're also um, multi-timescales, and, and I've just illustrated that with the previous slide, 
they're open systems, um, and you can see on the right hand side there the little diagram from the IPCC that quite clearly you know highlights how external terrestrial and external marine influences come together at the coast. And we, we really struggle with, with defining boundaries for coastal environments. So the spatial um, capture, the capturing of spatial information at the coast is very, very important and continuous uh, and systematic spatial capture is very important in that context. Coasts are also nonlinear systems and that's as a result of what we call the morpho morphodynamic feedback. So that's um, illustrated in the bottom diagram there, and particularly the bottom right it, where you can see waves and tides, for example, might shift sediment around, but the shifting of the sediment then changes the morphology of the coast, and the morphology of the coast or the, the shape and the configuration of the coast will determine how tides and waves act upon it. And sometimes these can be really quickly step changed uh, in time through an extreme event like a tsunami or a coastal storm surge or, or something like that. And for that, we really need high cadence uh, observation to resolve what happens um, at those times. We also um, have an advantage at the coast with respect to um, Earth observation, and that is that effectively where we have tides, the tide is, is um, a natural elevation marker or can be a natural elevation marker for us, but the tides go in and out twice a day. And so if we want to use um, the tide as an elevation marker, we need to have at least daily imagery of where the, where, um, the coast is underwater and where it's exposed in order for us to disentangle what the elevation might have been like at that time in combination with you know tide gauge and water level information. Um, and the, I mean, the beauty of that is that if we have um, satellite uh, observation systems that where the, the overpass is at the same day, at the same time each day, the tide uh, times will shift on a daily basis. So daily acquisition of images uh, allows us then to um, to look at the water line at different stages over a sequence of days. And that was done by um, the Scottish Coastal Dynamics Project team here, which I've um, used their kind of little portal for to produce this slide for an, an area just to the north of Dublin, which is where I am. And by looking at the frequency of water levels at different uh, in, in, in imagery, and uh, relating that to the tidal stage, so the stage of the water level at the time, we can then reconstruct um, a sort of surrogate for bathymetry or topography. And that's extremely useful because that then allows us over weeks or months to track the change in that topography. But that's only really possible if we have uh, high cadence uh, imagery and and in this particular case here we have people's properties at risk. Um, we have the beach suffering erosion and people trying to stop that erosion with um, very um, sort of non not very efficient uh, concrete um, blocks that you can see on there. And uh, these are really you know big issues, big societal political issues that need to be addressed. Now, one way of addressing them uh, of recent years has been to uh, replenish the sediment supply that is our natural buffer to the sea at the coast. And we have some great examples here from the Netherlands there, the sand motor, as it's called on the right hand side. And also in the bottom of the images here, a site uh, in the UK where uh, a lot of the UK gas comes on shore at Bacton on the Norfolk coast. And at this particular um, place, the um, sand was placed less in a sort of triangular shape as, as it has in the top there on the, on the Dutch coast, but more in an elongated fashion. And we can use this waterline method to track where this sediment goes over time after it has been placed. And again, for that, we need high cadence uh, imagery because otherwise we won't be able to use the, the tide lines to give us this topographic proxy. Um, and really, in terms of the, the application here in this particular project, which involved um, Jeff, who's leading the session, and um, a company called jo Yoga, and uh, myself, and then Planet, and a, a government partnership, the Coastal Partnership of East in the UK, 
we were able to gain unprecedented affordable you know insights into the system dynamics and and it's really relatively low cost uh, the capacity is there for early warning action so if you apply this kind of method you can see where the beach thins out over time and where then perhaps remedial action is urgently needed um, it's also an opportunity for connecting uh, human and natural drivers. Um, so one of my PhD students started to look, for example, at human activity on the coast over time and how that might then interface with the dynamics of the coast themselves in uh, imagery and time sequences of imagery. So um, it involves, you know, it, it allows us to involve non-specialists in the process and that in terms of coastal management is also a very, very important uh, sort of add-on um, effect of using this kind of imagery and the visualization of that kind of imagery. So all in all, I think, um, you know, it's the, the coast is an area where um, high cadence acquisition of imagery is getting more and more important. I think we're sort of on a, on a rise in terms of the use of um, of imagery at the coast. Uh, I myself am not a remote sensor, but work with remote sensors in that space. And I can just see that there's, you know, we're, we are really um, just in, in need of more and more uh, solutions on this front in order to resolve the impacts of sea level rise, the impacts of uh, higher frequency of extreme storm surge events and so on. So thank you very much for listening and um, I look forward to the discussion later. Great, thanks very much Iris. That's, uh, well, it's, it's good to see some, some of my results as well. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, um, it's a key environment for when we consider in how we exploit high cadence EO. So right, I'm gonna quickly rush on now to my final, uh, the final presentation. Um, I, just, I just want to check, is it Freddie, is it you or Gonzalo who will be doing the presentation? Uh, we're both going to be doing the presentation. I'm sharing, uh, I'm sharing the deck. Uh, Fre you are Freddie. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, who's... Okay, it's just I need to make one of you the presenter. Sure, yeah. Uh, you can make me and I'll be sharing the deck throughout the presentation. Okay, there you go. You're ready, should be ready to go now. Cheers. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen here? Oh, no, no, I don't. Yep, that's looking great. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, I'm going to start now. So, hi, everyone. Um, um, we are, um, my name is Freddy, and uh, with Gonzalo Mateo Garcia, Dolores Mateo Gar uh, Dolores Garcia, and Kevin Dobbs, uh, we're we're been working on this uh, project that we're using uh, very high resolution optical data and topographic data to map the flowing waters of the United States in a near uh, daily fashion, in daily fashion, so in a near real time fashion. Um, so this project has been uh, under the umbrella of the Frontier Development Lab, which is a private-public partnership between NASA, um, SETI Institute, and uh, Trillium, uh, the company producing FDL. And uh, it, its saying is to to apply ML to to various scientific domains like hydrology. Uh, in this instance, for the purposes of uh, the situational awareness of uh, stream of waters. Now, uh, traditionally, the way waters have been mapped uh, in the United States, uh, so they have, there's this data set called the National Hydrographic Data Set that um, has been the, the result of decades of uh, field work collecting the, the locations and the state of the streams. Um, but what's, what's the most thing, what's the, the reason why such as it's are, um, they they have an observation cap is because the the, the intermittency of the streams uh, change throughout the decades. So this is not updated in data like this. Um, this observation gap is more obvious when we're considering that uh, most of the, the the gauge devices that measure the level of the streams is mostly situated on the biggest uh, rivers, the ones shown in blue, and then the the rest of the dendritic network shown in red. Uh, is not observed at all in terms of uh, its flowing state. So this is this is the promise of remote sensing. This is what um, 
Earth observation and satellite data, especially, promise to, to bridge uh, by looking on the ground and uh, hoping to to uh, give us this kind of capability in a daily fashion. Now, um, but for this to do, in order to really uh, extend the observational horizon of the dendritic network, we we need very high resolution. And here I'm showing you uh, examples of. Uh, pervasive satellite imagery like Sentinel-2 where we can see the main body of water but not as tributaries. On the other extreme, we have things like Worldview-3 where at a half a meter resolution, we can clearly see the tributaries and the body of water. However, it's important to note here that uh, Worldview-3 uh, is task-based, is not archived, so is, this imagery cannot be provided in a daily fashion. Now, somewhere in between the, the plant scope, uh, the plant scope uh, constellation, gives you this nice trade off of daily cadence and uh, relatively high resolution. Now we using, and it's here uh, note that we are using the, we're also using the Planet Fusion product of Planet. Uh, so we have two years worth of daily data across all the, the water basins, uh, various uh, water basins in the United States. And this we fuse it with uh, LiDAR point cloud data uh, from which you get things like DEMs and other derivatives like heel shades when we combine with the time acquisition and and uh, we know where shadows are and stuff like that. So Gonzalo is going to tell you all about this product. Uh, I'm going to give you a very uh, quick overview of the pipeline. Uh, this is more pictorial rather than, than the um, descriptive. So we start from a satellite image and, and then using a unit, we train it to detect water, right? So this is semantic segmentation. Uh, you're familiar with that term and and that where every pixel is predicted, whether it's the probability that this pixel is water or not. Uh, here you're seeing a heat map of uh, a DEM for that same location, uh, where you know this is data we get from the national, uh, the USGS National Elevation Program. And then from that, uh, we extract flow lines, uh, vector data that tells where water can theoretically flow. Now from that, the branching patterns, we can we can. Uh, extract the these little segments called reaches. And then for each reach, we can aggregate the probability of the neural network to tell us the, the percent of it covered by water. Now, again, because we have daily data of planet fusion, we can do the same analysis daily, uh, which gives us a dynamic hydrology map of the coverage at, this, at the reach level. Uh, so this is a fundamentally new type of hydrology map that uh, whose patterns, whose time series can give you cues, could provide us cues for uh, how the waters expand and they recede, uh, which can help us for, 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 for tackling things like drought and, and uh, floods. Now I'm going to hand it over to Gonzalo, who's going to tell you more about the pipeline. Hi, uh, thank you, Freddy. So um, I'm going to tell you about how we build this, this pipeline, this peaks to stream pipeline. Uh, which, as Freddie mentioned, is based on, first, it has two main components. One is the neural network that is producing pixel-wise probabilities. And then the second part of the pipeline, it's about aggregating these pixel-wise probabilities across uh, the reaches, right? So the, to, to, and then to obtain the, the probability of water for each reach. Uh, what I'm showing here is the products, some of the products that we're using, the three on the top, are the products that we're using as input to the uh, neural networks. So actually the neural networks uh, take the plant scope image and then some lighter derivatives, and they are trained on uh, labels that are taken from uh, from images of the exact same day of Worldview 3. So actually we have a coincident images of Worldview 3 and planet scope, and then we use the Worldview 3 images for labeling because of their higher spatial resolution. And then we obtain these labels, which actually are polygons uh, indicating which areas are either uh, water or no water. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so this is how uh, the neural network that we train, how it looked like. Uh, it's a multi-headed unit because uh, it has different inputs. Uh, so these inputs are the different uh, derivatives of the DEM plus uh, three days uh, of planet images, right? So actually the day that we want to predict and the previous and, and, and the next image. And as we could see, every image 
are is fed into the network as at their input resolution. So we are not uh, we're not reprojecting any image. This is done all with the with the neural network. And the output of the of this model, it's a uh, water probability. So actually for each pixel we have the probability of water. But this is given at 0.5 meter per pixel resolution. So actually, uh, and this is because again uh, we use uh, the, the networks were trained with uh, images uh, from Worldview 3. So actually, we can we want to get to see if we could predict water at even higher pro uh, resolution than planet. Uh, next slide. And this is uh, the results of the segmentation models. Uh, we see that. Uh, if we use planet plus some um, um, lighter derivatives, we get uh, segmentation accuracy around 90%. And however, if we add as input the hill shade, uh, which is, uh, as Frey says, is just a derivative of the DEM, and what we use also uh, the time of acquisition of planet to see the solar zenith angle and the observation angle of the satellite to see how the satellite would be uh, to see what, what are the, the 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 shades made by the by the terrain. So if we add this input to the neural network, we get a prediction which is almost uh, ninety four percent, which is uh, still far from using only uh, Worldview three images for segmenting. But as we could see, uh, this uh, model the advantage is that it could be applied to a time series of of planet image just. Uh, in comparison, if we only use uh, Maxar, which we are not going to have this daily cadence. And then uh, just a word about the aggregation of the water probabilities over the reaches. Um, these are uh, so um, this is the stream network that we use. Um, and this is derived using a standard uh, hydrology model such as Taudem. So actually, we got uh, the streams, and then we got the catchments, which is the area for each stream, uh, that area to contribute to each of those streams. And then we also use the vertical distance to the nearest stream as a way to filter um, the false the predictions over areas. So actually, we are not predicting on areas that are very far from uh, the nearest stream. And then if we go to the next slide. OK, uh, this is the image of one area uh, shown at the wall view image. So actually, this is coincident image with the plan scope image. And then if we go next, what we see is um, yeah, at the bottom, the planet, the same planet image from the exact same, from the exact same day. And uh, the output of the model over the reaches network. So actually, we have for each of these reaches, we have a value that is could be interpreted as the probability of water in each of those reaches. And the good thing of this is that, as Freddie has shown in the video, uh, we have for each of those reaches and for each day in the two years time series of planet, we have an estimate. Uh, we have an estimate if that reach had water for that particular date. And yeah, if we go next sleep. Uh, so just to summarize, to conclude, uh, we have developed a new data-driven hydrology map at the stream level that produce estimations of water on uh, daily estimations of water on at the reach level. We have shown that actually we can fuse planet imagery with uh, data elevation models and, yeah, and other uh, data elevation model derivatives such as the hill shades to actually produce more accurate segmentations that are still not as good as using Max our image as input, but good enough for an operational product. And then the third thing is like we are open sourcing the pipeline that we have developed that is called Otherworks and will be available soon. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is the people that has contributed to the original uh, FDL challenge. Uh, and also uh, as Freddie didn't mention, but uh, the, this this particular challenge was also sponsored by Planet. Uh, the USGS and the Google Cloud, and the USGS also uh, provide us a, a lot of uh, support with the uh, three with the uh, lighter derivative products that that we have used in this work. Yeah, so thank you. Brilliant, great, thanks very much. So I think we've uh, we've had there five really 
really sort of different applications there, um, but all of them showing the importance of having access to that both fine spatial resolution and high cadence Earth observation data. Uh, and I think it, <clears throat> it shows that we kind of we need this information both for us uh, in response to specific um, uh, incidents, such as uh, what Wim was saying about the, um, the the removal of date palms, for instance, or particular events of uh, burning of crops, etc. Um, but also that it then also provides a rich data source on which to build other information by looking at those temporal profiles that uh, Annette and uh, Luciana were looking at as well. So I think it's um, I think we've we've proved the point that uh, high cadence earth observation is definitely uh, is definitely needed out there. Um, we've had no questions in the chat, so but anyone who's who's here, please feel free to stick a question into the chat if you wish. Um, I, I've got a, a few questions and um, Again, going back to my sort of my historical background in uh, dealing with imagery that uh, maybe came through the post on a quarter inch mag tape, etc. Um, what dealing with daily image acquisitions? I mean, it does sound like a bit like a dream come true, but uh, what are the bottlenecks and challenges and problems that that we have to overcome to make that information um, sort of properly accessible and, and and usable in in viable applications? Does anyone want to offer a thought? Can go <laughs> based on, on my my experience as an agronomist who is taking a lot of courses on remote sensing. I'm not a native on remote sensing, so for me, my my first uh, problem in some sort was the amount of information and how to deal with with that amount and also how to store the data in a properly manner. <laughs> and be able to use it. Most of our work was conducted on Google Earth Engine, but even though that I didn't have that information on my computer, because I, at some point we had terabytes of, of images, I still have the challenge to upload everything to Google Earth Engine and slice that <laughs> per year, because the, the quota that normally we have on Google Earth Engine is not quite broad. To, to conduct a pipeline. And I think, of course, when more people would be involved on that, that will disappear, that won't be a problem, but at least that was my experience. And I'm totally open to still pay that price <laughs> for having daily data. Mm -hmm. right. Anyone else? I mean, I, th I think it's, oh, sorry, go on. No, I fully agree with you, Chan. I think that's the, the biggest challenge now, how to um, to analyze this m massive volume of data. And I think it also, somehow I think it also puts pressure on uh, on the sector producing these massive data sets. We have to make use of it in the best way. And yeah, so to not have these satellites just turning around the earth, but uh, yeah. So also use the methods that are available at, at their best and, and, and get the information that's available for those who, who, who use it in the end. I, th I think I can't remember who it was. I remember someone saying about that it's the actual packaging up of this information uh, into a form that can be used by the sort of non-expert. But um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you in a room full of Earth observation people, they will all sit there and talk about various platforms and and algorithms, but if you're then trying to convince um, as a non-expert users to use that, then that's uh, it's more of a challenge. Uh, anyone else? Bottlenecks, problems, Iris? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wondered. Um, thanks, Jeff. It's really that's a really interesting question. I wondered whether there is a bottleneck in expertise. Therefore, you know, whether we're we're actually producing enough. Um, speaking as somebody who's you know, Professor of Geography uh, at the university here, you know, are we producing enough graduates who know and have the skills to be meeting that challenge in the future? Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's a good point. I mean, um, I mean, maybe uh, Freddie or uh, your team might have an idea about this crossover between the sort of data scientists uh, and the geographers. And is there is there a a kind of two way street there or, or do these kind of people sit in different <laughs> different tables in the coffee bar, so to speak? 
Oh, definitely. Um, I think this particular project uh, wouldn't be successful without having a tight loop between the USGS and uh, and the uh, ML experts. Uh, in particular, we had to understand. Uh, we needed, first of all, we needed their help, their domain expertise to provide us the labels for because this is a supervised learning approach. But uh, but also we needed to understand uh, to what level do we need. Uh, a situational awareness uh, because it's, it's one thing to just give you a segmentation of where water is, where the model thinks where it is, but then to incorporate that, to infuse that with the available vector data, the, the, land, the, the landscape, sorry, the topographic data, uh, we need to understand how this uh, different derivatives is generated and how to be interpreted. Uh, and also in the future, you know, what do you do with this time series? Uh, how do you consume it? I think there the use cases are many, but uh, depending on the exact use case, there are nuances that uh, that we need to understand in order to to make this this kind of pipeline uh, uh, operational. I mean, and the, the, the follow up I'd have to that is I, I do quite a lot of work in the kind of user requirements sort of uh, area. And uh, I think it's also for, for the users to understand what can be generated by both observation and machine learning, et cetera. And these, these sort of processes, um, I mean, I, 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 was, I was actually did some work on the new version, new sentinels that have been developed. And when I asked for people's requirements, they, they, hadn't even, they weren't even aware of Landsat. So they were giving me sort of Landsat specifications. And I said, oh, well, no, that's been around since the 1980s. You know. And I think there's a kind of learning process there for people to be aware of, you know, it's not paper maps anymore. It's these very dynamic products that can tell them some really interesting things. They really rich data sets uh, to drive their requirements. <clears throat> okay. Any more? Yeah, I think you have to remember here that machine learning's role is one that complements the human factor. Like I think, to answer your question on the on the high on the daily cadences that. The yes, daily cadence allows us to do a lot of things, but now you're in a regime where you no longer have the capacity to manually, for a human being to have the time to yeah. to to digest all this data. This data has to be mined, yeah. not looked at by a human. So this is this is where machine learning comes in. Yeah, and uh, uh, Vim's put his hand up. Yeah, I think uh, I think one, I'm one of the few people here people here in the room who doesn't have a, a GIS background, but what was helpful for me that through uh, platforms such as Sentinel Hub, but also um, various platforms made available like EarthMap uh, and various easy scripts to be used on for um, um, Google Earth Engine, made it a really Earth Observation really accessible to uh, and myself and also other people who have an interest in this and applying this in, in our work stream. I think that's also an advantage with with current methods um, and and platforms that many organizations are working on, that we can easily use like uh, like Sentinel information, Landsat, but hopefully also soon uh, Planet imagery as well um, to 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 include it in our work stream and our thinking. I think particularly in the humanitarian community, uh, but also the humanitarian disarmament community, um, this has been. Put forward a lot of progress in doing research, uh, and not just this, but also for environmental activists working on these kind of things. Um, I think that's that's the advantage of having this short data made made accessible for for amateurs like myself or people who can you know watch a couple of YouTube videos on basic programming skills for um, various uh, languages that can be applied to um, assess certain changes, and we always will need. Um, professionals to do more in-depth analysis, but it's it's a good starting point. Yeah. Um. Do you think um the sort of whether the um it's happening way way too quick for the uh, for the policy cycle? I mean, the title the title of the session was get inside the human decision making uh, loop, but uh, but the, these changes have happened in well less than a decade. You know, we've gone from a very landsat based. Um, uh, sector through to uh, you know having the the planet constellations, also the radar constellations coming along, etc. So uh, I mean, I wonder if it maybe in this next decade, it will 
the impact will really be felt because more people will be aware and the tool more tools will be there and there'll be more use cases and examples. Well, to quickly respond to that, I think it's already getting into the human decision making loop because we can respond very quickly to incidents and uh, we can use it for fact checking when it comes to like what happened this summer with like uh, the waterfall and water shortages and immediately feedback into discussions, for example, what we do uh, on particular water cases in Syria. We get requests from humanitarian organizations from the UN, provide information, and that's being fed into even political decisions in UN Security Council. So that's like just with basic knowledge, you can, uh, and of course, make sure to verify, but it can, it's getting into the loop immediately. Uh, and even for advocacy use, uh, for example, if there's a, a spill incident, which happened also on the coast of Syria, uh, where we use uh, radar imagery and other imagery to identify where the spill was heading, other more professional agencies jumped in uh, and published about it and yeah, and, and put the issue on the radar of response, emergency response um, organizations and generate uh, attraction uh, that influenced policy response. Brilliant. That's great. And Annette? Yeah, I, I can only agree. And I think, I don't think um, we, it can't, it can be too fast because um, we should continue going with this train now. No, I think in the past decades, we have managed to, to move from a rather research domain into a really, to the applied side. And I still remember that's more from the disaster context, also users asking for more frequent observations and um and Wim showed this no and he said it is so I think it responds also to to this user requirement for some specific applications but with for other applications having the data now available we can show of what else earth observation is capable of of doing no for for these uh yeah mm -hmm. water coastal applications or or crop monitoring so I think it's even um more of an argument to convince policymakers to to rely also more on, on earth observation data to adopt them in their workflows and, and decision making processes. Yeah, that's so in some ways it's almost becoming more mainstream that uh, people will think in these terms. Um, I know there was always the joke when um, Google Earth first came out that people went outside and looked up to see if they could see the camera looking down, you know, but it, 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 it was obviously won't be that, but it's uh, we, we're getting almost to that point where events can happen and we can uh, we can challenge those events with Earth observation and uh, Earth observation information. So uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's obviously it's on the up, and uh, you know let's hope this becomes a lot more mainstream and uh, and nobody will be producing those land cover maps that take seven years to go from the first first image to the uh, the finally published report. Yeah. But I, I think we're supposed to wrap up. We've we've already run over time. So does it, do anyone have any final comments to make before uh, before we all sign off? It's been a really interesting session. I think because if you, if you run over time, it usually means that there's lots of interesting stuff to say. So I think uh, I will, I'll count that as a success. So. Definitely. <laughs> anyone else have anything? There's no more questions in the box. So, uh, okay, well, I'll just uh, like to thank everybody. I think that's it's been really great, and uh, thanks for your time and efforts putting these presentations together. And I hope uh, at some point in the future we can all meet up face to face and talk about this stuff over a coffee or a beer or or wh whatever's appropriate. But uh, but yeah, I'll I'll keep in touch with everyone, and um, you know we all have plenty of links in common uh, through Planet and other things. Um, and there are other events coming up. I mean, the Living Planet Symposium is coming up in the, in Bonn next year. So, uh, you know, maybe that's an opportunity to catch up or, or maybe have another special session. I'll, uh, I'll talk to people about that and see what we can pull together. If, if nothing else, I think we should get together and try and start to talk more about, uh, about these ideas. It's great. Okay. So I think uh, if we call it a day then, uh, well, it's an evening here, but in uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, uh, I guess you're going back to the office now, Luciana. Yes, in a few minutes. It's noon here, and the sun is really, <laughs> really going down. Is it great? Well, it's raining in the UK, so uh, I think I'll go and hide under a rock now.
<laughs> but uh, yeah, once again, thanks everybody. It's been great, and uh, I'll just take I'll just take a quick screenshot if everyone doesn't mind. I think I've got everyone who's presenting. Uh, yeah. Got this. Uh, I'll just try once more. Fred's moving his screen around. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot, and uh, have all have a great day and good uh, good evenings, and see you soon. Thank Have you. Nice Thanks for all. Thank you very much. Bye. All right.